Okay, it's time for our uh, fourth uh, set of lectures. Uh, Saravi Chef has been uh, an organizer of this school for uh, many years, and uh, this year we decided to use him also as a lecturer. So he's going to talk about the uh, last case structure. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, the first day is usually the longest, and then, of course, the last day is the longest, yeah? <laughs> but uh, um, so I will be talking about large-scale structure. You're going to get two flavors of large-scale structure uh, in this school. Uh, the one you'll get from me will be a little bit of linear perturbation theory, and then the very nonlinear regime and how to match the two. Uh, next week, Leonardo Senatore will give you the intermediate regime, yeah? um, so the effective field theory of large-scale structure. Um, so if you want, mine is more the phenomenology of large-scale structure, and then he's doing a little bit more than that. Okay. Um, but because it's the first lecture, uh, I need a little bit of input from you guys, okay? Uh, I, I will, as we go through, I will list a bunch of topics, and I obviously can't cover all of them, so I'll be asking you uh, which one to go into in detail. I'll tell you what, what I'm thinking of doing, but then uh, if it's old news to you, then you should tell me, all right? I also realize that usually when we do this school, we, we have a little bit about uh, just background cosmology, um, which we haven't done in this school, right? So luminosity distance, angular diameter distance, things like this. Uh, for how many people is that, uh, were you expecting to see it covered here? How many people know it already? Okay, how many don't know it? And the people in between? <laughs> okay. It's, I think I know, but I'm not sure, or vice versa. <laughs> I know, I'm, I don't know. Okay, um, so on the slides, which will be available uh, through the ICTP website, I have a little more detail about these distances, but I'm, I, I mean, we'll flash through them here, but I'm not deriving anything. I'm just showing you that they are here, okay, because we don't have that much time uh, to, to cover this. But I did want to set the stage a little bit. Uh, using that. So I want, to, I want to split the discussion up into cosmology tests are uh, broken up into tests based on geometry and tests based on the growth of structure. And many of the tests that are based on the growth of structure actually have some of the geometry also built in. Um, and so, so I just want to set that up before we start doing actual probes using the growth. Yeah? Um, so, so that's a quick, uh, quick map of the the history of the universe, right? So uh, far away is long ago. That's the light from the, the microwave background. That light has to travel to us. It travels through a universe that for a long time is dark, though there was a lot of excitement a couple of months ago with possibly the first detection of the time that the universe's dark ages started to change, yeah? the epoch of reionization. Um, and the universe then continues on, the first stars form, the first galaxies cluster together, the clusters, the, the galaxies group into clusters um, until the present time. Current galaxy surveys, they probe this region here, somewhere out to here, the next generation of data sets are about halfway back to the CMB. Yeah, so that's, that's the current state of, uh, of probing with, this, uh, with galaxy surveys. So you see one thing quite quite neatly here, which is that the epoch of reionization gives you a test of large-scale structure that uses a lot more volume than you get with a galaxy survey. Um, and so that's something to look out for in future. Yeah? Um, people who, who give reionization talks, they'll emphasize the fact that uh, the, the co-moving volume accessible to reionization studies is 90% of the volume compared to what we currently probe. So it's a very powerful probe coming in the future. But I won't be talking about it. <laughs> I'll be talking about the galaxy surveys more than, more than the gas. OK? Um, so I said uh, large-scale structure, the tests are geometry or growth. Um, and uh, geometry, so, so Chiro will be talking about uh, the microwave background, so I won't say much about that. The other geometrical probe are, are the, the supernovae. Yeah, so, so these ones are using luminosity distances, and these ones are using angular diameter distances. There's an intermediate probe that's called the baryon acoustic oscillations. So these are the signature of the CMB, but seen in the galaxy distribution. And so one idea I had for structuring the course was 
by the time HERO is done with the CMB, you will have the physics that makes the baryon acoustic oscillations. You will have seen the power spectrum in the light. And then I will set up the formalism, or I will set up what that signature should look like in the galaxy distribution. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so that's one option, right? That's kind of a nice option because it, it ties together the geometry with the growth. Um, and it's a, it, it, it's a very powerful probe, very, uh, it's motivating a lot of the galaxy surveys currently. Okay. Um, associated with the CMB, uh, secondary anisotropies, HRO mentioned some of them. Um, and so, so, so I'll, I'll quickly go through a little laundry list of those guys, which I won't talk about more. Okay? Um, but what you'll see is that many of these have to do with uh, places uh, where there are clusters. And so one of the things I'll be trying to set up is, uh, is a description for how clusters form, how clusters cluster, and this will give you a framework for doing the phenomenology of large-scale structure, for doing how to incorporate fully nonlinear effects together with uh, perturbation theory. Okay? Um, and, uh, and so, so, so the cluster counts and the clustering, they sort of go hand in hand, and you will see uh, in the course of the week why they go hand in hand. So if you have a, if you, if you have a model for one, you get the other one for free. Um, okay. Another probe is redshift space distortion. So this is not using just the positions of galaxies, but how they move. So it's incorporating a fair amount of velocity information as well. Uh, that's a very complementary probe to just, just measuring the densities in particular. If you're interested in the possibility that gravity is not GR, then looking for consistency between the real space and the redshift space is a powerful probe. I'll have some time to do this, but I wasn't really going to concentrate on redshift space distortions unless people would prefer that to the clusters. Yeah? Uh, so we, we'll, we'll mention them. We'll mention redshift space distortions and weak gravitational lensing, the other probe. And we will set up a language that lets you, lets you estimate all these things. But we won't cover them in detail. Yeah? So we'll, we'll cover in more detail. My plan is the baryon oscillations and the cluster counts. Uh, but we will end up with something called the HALO model, which lets you describe uh, all the observables up here. Okay. Who really wants me to do redshift space distortions? A fair number of you, okay. Who really wants me to do gravitational lensing? Uh, okay. Uh, who wants to come back for a school in two years from now? <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, uh, I, I will figure out a plan, and maybe we can, uh, we can have some discussions after, uh, in the afternoons after the lectures or something like that, because there's no way we can cover all of this uh, in, in the school. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, of course, you know, the hope is that at the, at the end of this school, you guys will go on to careers, and we will add one of your probes to this list. Yeah? Um, okay. So quick thing, what, what do we get from uh, geometry? Well, we basically know the universe is expanding. That's Hubble's picture, yeah, the, the linear Hubble law. So this is just a quick background of cosmology, right? Um, and uh, his initial measurement was Hubble constant was 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec. That number was wrong. We now think it's, we, we know it's 70. There's discussion in the field, right, whether it's 68 or 72. That's also an interesting discussion. We're doing large-scale structure, so when we come back and we do the BAO, then we might come back to that question okay, of, uh, of, of these two different estimates. But, uh, but it's serious progress that we're talking about uh, five kilometers per second rather than 50. Okay. Um, okay, we make an estimate of the age of the universe by taking the inverse of the Hubble constant. Everyone familiar with that? Yeah, kilometers per second per megaparsec. Kilometer is a distance, megaparsec is a distance, so this has units of one over time. If the universe expanded always with this same speed, with this same rate, then the inverse of this would be extracting to, back to the time when everything was together. Yeah. Um, okay, if you take Hubble's number, you do this extrapolation, you get a few billion years. That's younger than the ages of the stars in the universe. Or not all the stars, but there are plenty of older stars. And so something must be wrong. 
And uh, so more modern values give you a more reasonable number, 70 kilometers per second. You take the inverse, you get 14 billion years. Okay? Um, and, and we have yet to find a star that is older than this. So, so, so that at least holds together. Um, so, so, so this is doing that estimate uh, for people who aren't familiar, who are, who are more used to MEV and uh, more used to <laughs> other units. We'll be talking about megaparsecs a lot. Um, and so it's useful to go through here to, to just get used to the, the, the change of units. Yeah? OK, uh, so, so this slide is up there just, uh, just to get used to units. OK, um, so, so universe is expanding. And uh, Eichiro put up earlier uh, a metric, right? And he said, how do we calculate distances? How do we calculate separations? So distances in space and in time. Um, and uh, if space is homogeneous and isotropic, then uh, so, so there's the, there's the ho homogeneous um, part. And uh, this one is, we're just doing space. We haven't put the time on here yet, right? Um, and uh, then, then we can have space that's uh, curved, positive, or negative, or flat. Yeah? Um, and uh, and we, can, we can calculate uh, distances this way, or uh, separations this way. Okay. Um, the Robertson-Walker metric, Friedman-Robertson-Walker metric adds in time. Uh, just change the signature for time, and that's it. It's otherwise the same thing. And, uh, and so much of observational cosmology is about you know, figuring out what kappa is for the curvature, um, what the expansion factor is, that kind of thing. Yeah? So, so that's, uh, that's the geometrical tests are doing that. I have a bunch of slides here on distances in cosmology that I won't go through. They're just to show you that they're here. So if, if for those of you who didn't raise your hands or who raised it as a maybe, go through these slides tonight. Yeah? Um, so, so this one is setting up for you um, how we think about distances. It's setting up uh, what we mean by redshift, deriving the redshift explicitly, the relationship between redshift and expansion factor when you, when you start from this metric. Yeah? Um, okay, so, so there finally is the relationship between redshift and expansion factor that you know and love, but, uh, but that's the, the derivation is in there. Um, the other thing we care about are luminosity distance and angular diameter distances, because if we do want to do geometry tests, then these are the two kinds of things that enter. The distances, the luminosity distance is, well, it's really, we're trying to do flux is luminosity divided by an area over which the photons were spread out. Yeah? Um, and so we need to worry about how we're going to calculate uh, the area and how we're going to calculate the luminosity, because luminosity is an energy per unit time. And we have to worry about time being modified in GR. Um, and we also have to worry about the curvature modifying how we calculate the distances. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so you know, for example, the luminosity, the energy, is as the universe expands, photon energies are being stretched. Photon wavelengths are being stretched, so energies are decreasing. Um, but time intervals similarly are being modified because time is frequency. Frequency, again, the stretching of the wavelength. Yeah. Um, and so, so you get powers of expansion factor uh, that enter when you, when you want to calculate a distance. Uh, that is a distance which satisfies the inverse square law right, that we're used to that the, the, the observed flux should fall as the inverse square of the distance. Um, OK. Similarly, the angular diameter distance is modified. Uh, the, the, the relation to luminosity distance is pretty straightforward. Uh, there's just extra factors of 1 plus z. Again, these are here just so you have a reference if you haven't seen this stuff before. Okay. Um, and then there are pictures of what these things look like. They show you, you know, what the the, 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 how you should convert from an observed angle into a physical size. You multiply by this factor if an object is at a certain redshift from us, yeah? meaning its light has been redshifted by 1 plus z. Okay. okay. So uh, also, also on here, though we won't use it, is the, is the expression for the age in, uh, in these models. One of the things that can, that can then be done with these distances is you can expand in the limit of small distances. Yeah? 
Um, and you can ask uh, what does the really, you know, what does the expansion factor do as a function of time? And we expand in small times from the present. Zero means the present. Redshift zero. Um, and, uh, and if we do that, then you know you can keep the first order term, which we, th this guy is like the Hubble constant today. Um, and then we have the, the next term, the derivative. You know, the second derivative of expansion factor, derivative of Hubble. Okay? Um, and so we can ask if the expansion is changing with time. The Hubble constant should be constant in space, but should be, could be changing in time. And uh, so a lot of observational cosmology is trying to make that measurement. Uh, what, would, what would that measurement look like? If you have objects at different distances from us, they should be receding from us because of the expansion. The slope of this line was Hubble's constant. If Hubble's constant has been changing with time, then the slope is one value at one time and another, another slope at a different time. And so as you look at, object, at light from objects that are far away, we should be getting a measurement of how the universe was expanding when the light set off from, you know, from that, that time, from that place. Um, and so we should see deviations from a straight line if we look at objects that are far enough away from us if the Hubble constant has been evolving, okay? And so, um, so if the universe was expanding faster in the past, then that means, so a, a, a flatter line like this means you have a bigger speed for the same distance, so that's a big expansion factor. And so if it was faster in the past because the natural expectation was, you know, if the universe was expanding, it should slow down in its expansion. So we expect it to have been expanding faster in the past and slower now. Then we would expect to find that galaxies nearby reflect a slower, a smaller Hubble constant than galaxies far away. So we're expecting something like the green line. And all the interest in dark energy is that we did not see that. We saw the opposite. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's, uh, that's the evidence from the supernovae showing the the, the brightness of supernovae as a function of redshift, so the recession speed. So this is their distance, and this is their speed. It's not plotted, or it's a little misleading, right? Because I showed you plots here, and I showed you curvature means something. So beware, because here there's only curvature because the plot is on a log scale. That, this is not that curvature, yeah? So you, here you really just want to look at the fact that there is a black line going through here, which is a, a universe with a cosmological constant yeah, that, fits, that fits the data. Um, okay, so there's a bunch of data from space-based and ground-based obs uh, observations. This is a slightly fairer plot, but it's still unfair because it's log still on distance, but now it's also log in, the, in this scale, right? Um, and so now you can see that it's kind of linear, and then there's slight deviations from the linear law, and that's that's the, that's the evidence for dark energy, right? Um, okay, so universe has had a complex expansion history. We now know that it was expanding faster in the past, but there was a time when it was decelerating. Yeah, so, 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 so these guys are probing the time when the universe was decelerating before it started accelerating with the dark energy, okay? Um, okay. So, so here's another way of plotting that. This is the difference from a model in which the universe uh, is decelerated in the past but is accelerating now. Okay. okay, this is probably the nicer way to look at it, right? So the universe decelerates and then accelerates. It wasn't always decelerating. Okay. If you haven't seen plots like this before, it's useful to go through it. There's a lot of information on them, right? So this is... Um, how much, so this is like redshift, how much the universe has expanded, right, from the present back. Um, and uh, so, so there it is expressed as redshift. Um, and, uh, and then the number of years as a function of time. And so now what you can see from a plot like this is different cosmological models have a different relationship between the redshift and the time. Yeah? And so the, the, the formula that I put up there before that was saying how you calculate age as a function of redshift, that, that, that gives you these sorts of curves. Okay? These sorts of curves also show you that for 
all universes normalize, for all models normalized to have the same Hubble constant today. These ones are less than 10 billion years old, whereas these models are more than 10 billion years old, and so you can use the ages of things to constrain plausible models. Okay. All right. So, so, so the supernovae are one type of geometry probe. The other type of geometry probe are uh, the, the CMB. And so from this, we're looking at the sizes of the spots in the CMB. And Eiichiro, I'm sure, will go through this in more detail tomorrow. Yeah? Um, and so, so this is more a geometrical test for, uh, you know, for, for curvature. Okay. Baryon acoustic oscillations are looking at this same the same signature, the same angular diameter distance relation, but now imagining that the, the rod that corresponds to the angular size of these spots is something that we can measure not at a redshift of 1,000 where the CMB photons originate, but at lower redshifts from galaxies. Okay? And so, so we will set that up. And that's very nice because the CMB is giving you one estimate of the geometry associated with the photons that had to travel from this surface all the way to us. So that's one probe of the entire expansion history of the universe. But if we, if we can make a similar measurement of a standard rod, a standard length at intermediate distances from us, then we can really map out the expansion history of the universe. And so that's what the baryon oscillation experiments are doing. Okay, so, so we'll talk about those once Eiichiro has set up the CMB. Okay, um, Eiichiro talked about the, so, so now we get into tests that are not just geometry, but include growth, okay? Um, and so a quick review of secondary effects in the CMB, uh, some of which Eiichiro will cover. Uh, so this one, he mentioned the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect. He showed you the picture of, a, I guess he had the photons going this way, right? So the photons are climbing out of a potential well. They continue, then they might drop into another one, and so on. And so if it is true that in the minima of the potential well is where galaxies are more likely to form, then it should be the case that you can sit on galaxies and measure the temperature of the CMB, even though the CMB is very far away. And the photons will have had to climb in and out of the potential well, which is holding the galaxies together, or the clusters of galaxies. And so you should see some signature of this effect. However, as Eiichiro noted, all these effects, the important thing is the change in the potential, which matters. And so we will have to care about a photon as it's traveling through one of these potential wells, whether the potential well changes. So the potential well will change because the universe is expanding. On the other hand, gravity is going to work and is trying to prevent the expansion of these potential wells. So there's a competition between the two. And so you can ask, you know, do they exactly balance? Does the expansion win? Does gravity win? And so, so this was, a, was an exciting probe because it had the potential. So it's, it's a probe that gives you zero signal if the two exactly cancel, because then the potential well, you know, the stretching, the lessening of the potential by the expansion is compensated exactly by the growth due to gravity. And then if there's no change in the potential, there's no effect. Okay? And so one of the things that we will set up is we will set up how quickly does structure grow in different cosmological models. And from that, we will see for which cosmological model we expect this effect to be null, and for which cosmological model we expect there to be some effect, because gravity won, or because the expansion won, and because dark energy won. OK? Um, and uh, so, so, so this is an exciting probe for that reason. Uh, and. Uh, so, so, so this, was, this is just a cartoon of, of, of the kinds of things uh, that Eiichiro was showing. The photons that fall in get blue shifted and red shifted, climbing back out. Yeah? Um, so that's the idea, right? The photons are traveling through the potential well. And as they go through, they will get blue shifted as they fall in, red shifted as they climb out. And those two effects might not compensate because they're doing it at different times. Universe may have changed. Potential well may have changed while they crossed. Okay. So, 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 so that's one effect. 
uh, with the CMB. Let me, let me skip this. Another effect with the CMB is gravitational lensing. I think you said you weren't going to really cover this. Yeah, so I just have one slide to, to show this. Um, so the idea is the, the photons are traveling through the universe to us. And so that means we're getting a slightly distorted view of the CMB. The distortions will depend on how much matter was between us and that surface of last scattering. Okay? And so, um, so that means how inhomogeneous the universe was because the photons will get deflected as they travel to us. Okay? If you want, the, the previous, the, the, the Sachs Wolf, integrated Sachs Wolf, was about the energy of the photons. This is about the position of the photons, okay? their, their deflections. Okay? Um, here is a map to show you what a primordial microwave background would look like if there was nothing between us and the microwave background. And this is if there's matter between us and the microwave background, which there is. This one has been exaggerated. And so you can see some pretty big distortions in the map. This has been way exaggerated so that you can see it. Okay? Um, uh, but, but you can see there will be patterns in the map that are induced by the large-scale structure along the line of sight. So this is a real growth area because people have started to measure it. To give you a feel for what the measurement is, here is the unlensed CMB. So this is, this is not a picture of the CMB, right? This is a simulation of the CMB. And then this is what lensing did to it. Yeah? So these are tiny effects. It's a tribute to scientists for having devised experiments that can measure these things, to engineers for having built these things that can make these precise measurements. OK? Um, OK, so, so, so that lensing is due to matter, is due to you know, gravity having clumped stuff along the line of sight. OK? Um, there's, a, there's a quick order of magnitude estimate. I will skip this because I don't have time, but it's on here. Come talk to me after if you, if you want uh, a little more detail about lensing. But uh, here's sort of the, uh, one of the more recent measurements, not so recent. Um, so you have the CMB power spectrum that Eiichiro showed before, and uh, the power spectrum is modified because of the gravitational lensing that has moved the photons around. Okay? Um, and, that, and this effect has now been seen with high significance, and so, so it's a very nice probe. We will also talk about gravitational lensing of galaxies rather than of the CMB photons. The CMB photons being lensed, they're, they're very nice because we know the distance to the last scattering surface. If we want to do gravitational lensing, we have to worry about the galaxies, what distance they are from us. There are a full range of distances, so it's a complicated problem. Galaxies have shapes. The microwave background, the spots in the microwave background, they have shapes, but we know how to describe those. Galaxy formation is a much messier business, and so it's a much harder measurement with, with, uh, with galaxies. Okay. So, so this, is a, this, is a, this is a very nice probe. It's also a nice probe because the CMB has been a very pristine measure of, of the early universe. And this is an effect on the CMB due to the late time universe. And so it's, we're, we're managing to use the CMB to give us information about uh, the universe later, right, than redshift of 1,000. And so, so that's a, a, a useful thing to be doing. Okay? Eichiro mentioned the sunyaev zeldovich effects. This one he also won't be covering. I'm only mentioning it here because, um, because it's another very useful probe, and we'll be making estimates of cluster masses, and those estimates help understand this signal. Yeah? Um, the idea is that uh, photons from the microwave background come and they hit this gas. They scatter. The gas is a million degrees. The photons are a million degrees. A lot less, yeah? They started out 3,000 degrees. They're now down to three. And so the, the photons are scattering, uh, Compton scattering of the, of, these, uh, of the gas, so of the electrons in the gas. Um, and that distorts the spectrum of the CMB. Okay? Um, it's a nice way to think of this problem. Think of it in the rest frame of the electrons. So the electrons are moving. 
they're moving pretty fast, right? They're a million degrees, so they're moving pretty fast. And so that means that each, fo each electron is seeing the CMB photons, but with a Doppler shift, right? They're seeing blue in the direction they're moving and red in the direction away from which they're, they're moving. Yeah? And so that means that each one is seeing a CMB of a slightly different temperature. And if you add together Planck distributions with a distribution of temperatures, you don't get a Planck distribution. So you'll get a slight distortion, and that's, that's the distortion. Okay? Um, so so, so in, the, in the notes, I give you a little bit more detail than I'm showing up here, where I, I go through a quick calculation to show you the sum of the, the, sum of the black bodies gives you this, the, the, the characteristic spectrum gives you a sort of, you know, you take, uh, you take photons from one side and populate the other side of the black body spectrum, okay? Um, and uh, so as a result, you, you, you take the low energy photons and you make them higher energy, okay? There's a pretty unique signature. And that means that if you're measuring the temperature of the CMB in the vicinity, so the, the photons had to pass through some of this gas, then you will see that the temperature changed. Um, you, you, will, you, will, you will see a, a change in, uh, in how, I would say the temperature changed, but really what happened is the number of photons at that wavelength changed, so it's brighter or fainter than you expect, depending on whether it was on the, the, the low energy side or the high energy side. Of, uh, of frequency. Yeah? And so you, you'll see a deficit and an enhancement, and so you'll see a hole or excess, yeah? depending on what frequency you look at. And uh, it's the same object you're looking at, so when you see it change with wavelength, this is a pretty nice signature. It's such a nice signature that it's become a nice way to actually look for clusters. Yeah? Um, because usually to see a cluster, what has to happen? The light has to get to, it from, uh, get to you from it, but that the light is falling as inverse square of the distance, so the more distant clusters are much harder to find. This one is not like that, right? This one, you have the light that's coming from the CMB, and it's being modified as it passes through the cluster, and it's going to be modified whether the cluster is close to us or far away from us. We're getting those photons anyway, and so it's a redshift-independent way of finding clusters. And so it's a, it's a powerful probe. Okay. Um, this is you know, going through the frequencies, what, what one of these clusters might look like as you march through frequency space and take photo think of it as taking photographs in the red band, the green band, the blue band, and so on, okay? Um, all right, and so, uh, so, so there are now many of these being found. Yeah, 10 years ago, there were 10 of them, and now, now we're talking thousands, right? So, so this is a growth area, okay. Um, I, I've said that this is independent of redshift. There's another thing that these clusters do. The clusters move. And so the effect that we, we described before was as a photon comes, it hits electrons, and the electrons are, are buzzing around with you know, 100 degree, uh, a million degrees Kelvin, 1,000 kilometers per second motions. Um, in addition, the clusters as a whole are moving. So that means that really the photons, they're coming, they're seeing a cloud of electrons and the electrons are all moving in one way. So there's a net Doppler shift and then on top of that, there are the motions with respect to the center of mass of the cluster. Yeah? Um, so the thermal effect versus the kinetic effect, the motion of the clusters themselves. And the first detections of this have just started to be made as well, um, the, the kinetic SC effect. And this is, remember I, I mentioned at the start, if you can measure densities as well as velocities, you have a nice probe of modified gravity models. And so KSC effects are beginning to measure lots of velocities. Yeah. So this is uh, um, another, another growth area. Okay. Um, so again, I won't be doing much with KSC or thermal SC effect, but I will be setting up the formalism for you to model that. Yeah. Okay. And very crudely speaking, we can think of a cluster as so this is the CMB with the sunyaev zeldovich kind of effect, okay? There's the weak lensing measurement, so the, the lensing of the photons as, they, as they've traveled through the cluster, um, and there's the cluster in X-ray gas, okay? And so we have many different probes of the cluster, so 
this, this morning's lecture about evidence for dark matter, there was, there was this question, oh, how do we know they're virilized? How do we know um, how much mass there is? So, so these different probes, the lensing gives the mass, the Sunyev Zeldovich is really giving you the electron pressure, uh, and the X-rays are giving you the electron temperature. Yeah, so, so there are multiple probes um, of clusters. So they're, they're, they're useful things to be studying. Um, okay. Um, and so, so, so we, we, will be, we will be setting up the framework for modeling galaxy clusters, right? Now, clusters, they contain information about gravity, one, you know, where gravity won against the expansion. So that's one thing they're telling us. But we always make a, we make a survey, right? So we look at a piece of the sky and we count up how many clusters there are. If gravity won, there will be more clusters than if, uh, than if expansion won. But we need to know how many to expect, and how many to expect will depend on what, what volume we have made the measurement in. And the volume we have made the measurement in will depend on, well, we made a measurement out to redshift one. There's a certain co-moving volume which is different if omega matter is 0.3 and omega lambda is 0.7 than if the numbers are different. Okay, so, so the geometry will set the survey volume in which you're measuring the counts. But the growth of structure in the background cosmology will set the, the actual counts. Okay, so so you, you get uh, you get both uh, both effects combined together. So you know so here's a here's a survey. We're there. This one goes out to a redshift of about 0.6. You can see that there's lots of galaxies, and then there are tight clusters of galaxies. And so so you know you, you can make measurements of the abundances of these clusters. We'll talk a little bit about how you can find, how you identify clusters like this in data. Um, and, uh, and we'll also talk about whether, you know, it's, it's very nice that you can measure clusters and properties of clusters, X-ray, pressure, um, and lensing. But what happens if you just use the galaxies themselves? And you didn't try to find the clusters, you just measured the clustering of the galaxies. Okay? Um, so, so, so we will set that up as well. Um, and again, any of those measurements will combine the volume that you've observed with counting the objects in that volume. Okay. Um, so, so schematically, right, so you're, you're going to measure a volume, and in the volume, there was a number density of clusters as a function of, you know, they might have a bunch of different properties. We'll go through, and at the end of this week, you'll see that the most important thing is their mass. Um, and the mass helps determine their temperature, their pressure, the speeds with which galaxies are moving inside them, all these things. Um, so, so if you have a model for the abundance of clusters as a function of their mass, you're in business. Um, and, uh, and, and then we'll also talk about the fact that although mass is the important thing, we don't observe really the mass. We observe an X-ray temperature, or we observe some observable that we have to convert to mass. And so, so, so sitting inside here really is something that looks more like the number that you observe is the volume in which you counted times the, the true number density of objects times the probability an object at that redshift, it's an object of that mass with that redshift, had that certain observable. And so that means some of cluster cosmology is associated with understanding the observable properties of clusters. So the cosmology is entering here, and the gastrophysics is entering here. Okay? Um, right, so we, we'll have some time to talk about galaxy scaling, galaxy cluster scaling relations, uh, probably on Friday. Okay. All right. Um, the, the, the last idea is uh, that Structure has to evolve from the smooth initial conditions to the present, and so it's the evolution of structure between the past and the present that contains information about cosmology. So this is from simulations where you take a whole bunch of dark matter particles, you let them move only because of gravity in an expanding background, and you ask, you know, how different was redshift zero <coughs> if they started from the same sort of initial conditions? Um, and so you can see that, you know, if the, the, the structure here is somewhat different from the, the structure in a model in which omega matter equals one and there's no cosmological constant, okay? Um, so, so, so the evolution matters. Nowadays, we play this game the other way around. We might normalize everything to the present and ask what, how different were they in the past, yeah? Um, 
And, uh, and nowadays, we're honing in. I mean, these gross differences that you can see by eye, they're no longer interesting. The differences are much, much smaller. They're along the lines of the, that lensing map that I showed you before. They're tiny differences. We're looking for percent level changes um, in parameters and percent level changes in measurements, in measured quantities. Okay. Um, okay. Um, here, oh, here's just a, just a picture that we will be making a model of uh, tomorrow, no, probably so Wednesday, the next, the next class, um, for the number of, of objects as a function of their mass. Uh, lots of low mass objects, few high mass objects, many more at low redshift than at earlier times. Yeah, so so the, the symbols are measurements from about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, as, as you know, the next generation will be coming in with smaller error bars on here. Okay, so we'll be ma we'll be ma making a model of that of that theory curve there. Okay, um, galaxy surveys are where this information comes from. Yeah, so galaxy surveys have gone from this was the 80s. This was about uh, 2000 2005. This is like 2010. Okay. And as I said, next generation are going about halfway back to the CMB. The problem with galaxy surveys is, if we look here, we can see that the galaxies are colored by, in this case, how bright they are, very bright, very faint. And you can see that the red seem to be in tighter knots than the blue. That means that the galaxies are clustered depending on whether they're red, or whether they're bright, or they're faint or the galaxies are clustered depending on whether they are red or they are blue. And so if the spatial distribution of galaxies depends on galaxy type, that means that not all galaxies are fair tracers of the dark matter. And the theory is always talking about the dark matter distribution, the clustering of the dark matter. The, and, uh, and so we need a language for converting from the point distributions that we see as galaxies to the underlying dark matter distribution. Okay, so we, we must be able to account for, for the fact that the light is not a fair tracer of the dark matter. And one of the things we'll be setting up is, uh, is a language for interpreting um, the difference between the distribution of the light and the underlying dark matter distribution. And so, so, that, so that thing is called, uh, is called the halo model. Right? So we'll be setting up uh, the language that describes how you make different point processes from the same underlying continuous dark matter field. Okay. Uh, yeah, the dark matter, I was going to say the dark matter is a particle. The particle is very small, and so we can treat it as though it's a continuous fluid compared to galaxies, right? because galaxies are billions of the mass of the sun. The dark matter particle is tiny. But I'm at Penn, and at Penn, uh, there's a guy called Justin Curry who has a model that says, well, maybe the dark matter is not a particle anymore. It behaves more as a superfluid. Uh, if you're interested in that, come talk to me after. Yeah? Um, okay, so, so, I'll be, so we'll be setting up the language for the halo model to describe the galaxy distribution and its relation to the dark matter. Okay? And, and it will turn out that, that this language provides uh, a language for describing a bunch of large-scale structure observables, so the, the weak lensing, the, the redshift space distortions, the BAO. Okay. So, so, the, so the goal is to set up that and to show you um, some generic things that you're going to get uh, as a result of this. And one of the things that will happen uh, when Leonardo comes to do effective field theory is he'll ask, how general can you make these conclusions? Okay. okay. So, so, there, so there will be gravitational lensing as well, yeah, as one of the, in, in these surveys. Uh, so here is a source, if there's nothing between us and the observer, uh, so nothing between us and the source, then we see this. If there is a cluster of galaxies between us and the source, then it gets quite distorted. It turns out that clusters are rare. One of the things we'll do in this course is we'll estimate that things the places where gravity has won are 200 times the background density. If they're about 200 times denser than the background, that means that they fill 1 over 200 of the volume. And that means that they are very rare. And that means it's very unlikely that you see something like this, 
where you, you have these nice lensed arcs, you're almost always in the regime where you just have faint distortions of images. Um, the, the distortions are small, and so to make a reliable measurement, you need many, many galaxies. And that's what has fueled, uh, fueled the, 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 the growth of large galaxy surveys, yeah, is, to, is to do the lensing. Yeah. So let me skip this. Um, one other detail about the lensing, because I won't, I think, say it again when we, uh, when we actually model the lensing, is that the lensing signal, if it's galaxies, we don't know the shape that the galaxy started out as. So we can't just measure the fact that the image was distorted. Instead, what we have to measure is that the distortion of this galaxy is very similar to the distortion of a galaxy nearby because the photons will have traveled almost the same path. Yeah. And, so, and so it's the correlations between the shapes of the objects that is the lensing signal. It's not the shapes themselves. And so that, you can imagine, is a much, much smaller effect yeah. because the galaxies can have a range of orientations even to begin with, and so you have to average over all that before you start to see the small correlated signal. And so that's why you need millions of galaxies to start, start, doing, start playing this game. Okay, um, so, so, so this one is sort of to illustrate uh, that you need to see, you know, maybe the galaxies are aligned along filaments, maybe they are uh, distributed differently around clusters, or aligned differently around clusters, things like this. Okay. Um, so, so here's sort of, again, an exaggerated view, right? So there's strong lensing. If there's a cluster between us and the source, you can see the distortions. But far away, this thing is still having an effect. So the cluster that caused this distortion also has an effect here. You just can't see it by eye. And so if you, if you just average over many, many, many galaxies that same distance, then you have a hope of measuring the small signal. So that's the weak lensing rather than the strong gravitational lensing. Okay, let me skip that. And this is redshift space distortions. So this is a weird way to show you the redshift space distortions. Imagine that you are at the center and you're looking, you're, you're receiving light from galaxies at different distances. So, though, so, so, so when that number is zero, that is if there were no motions in the universe. And that's not realistic. But so, that, so that's the picture that you would have got if you saw everything uh, without any redshift space distortion. Now, because the way we measure where something is, we, you know, we receive the light from it and we say, oh, um, it's here on the sky or it's there on the sky, but to know how far away it is from us, we just measure the spectrum. So we measure the redshift. The redshift is a combination of the expansion of the universe plus the fact that the galaxy itself is moving relative to the expansion. And so that extra little motion makes a signal. It means we have got the wrong distance along the line of sight compared to across the line of sight. And so, 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 so this is just a cartoon that's showing if the, if the speeds were very big, then you'll get very big distortions. But the distortions will only be along the line of sight, which means that if you had a blob that was, that was a sphere, something like this, then they might all get stretched out because of speeds that are high along the line of sight, either towards or away from you. And so, the, so these are called fingers of God. There's another effect, which is a sort of squashing that we will, we will derive when we do linear theory soon. Okay? Um, and so redshift space distortions mean that a signal that should have been isotropic will now be anisotropic. It will be different across the line of sight than along the line of sight. And so, so, so here's a measurement of the correlation function of galaxies. And we'll, we'll define correlation function and all that stuff uh, in, in the next lecture. But you should imagine that the measurement you should have seen was a circle. You're not seeing a circle. You're seeing a stripe sitting on top of something that's like a squished oval. And one of the things we'll do is we'll work out what's making the squishing, what's making the stripe. And we'll put those two effects together to describe this distortion. Yeah. So that's, that's redshift space distortions. The, the squashing tells us something about gravity um, in linear theory. And the, the length of the stretching along the line of sight is telling us something about the number of clusters that manage to form, and meaning win the fight against gravity. And so, uh, so, so that is another measure of cosmology. Okay. 
Um, so th we think the universe should be homogeneous, isotropic. So that means that any time we make a measurement, we can ask, do we expect the measurement to be isotropic? So if all you're doing is you're sitting on a galaxy and you're counting how many other galaxies are a certain distance from you, 10 megaparsecs away, 100 megaparsecs away, then that number should be independent of whether, you know, it should be spherically symmetric, the count. Yeah? So on average, it should be spherically symmetric. I've just shown you that it won't be if the way you measure distances, you use redshift rather than the true distance. Um, and uh, so the, so the Alcock-Pachinsky test was this idea that if this were not a problem, then you could find out what the correct cosmology was by saying um, you measure the distances along and across the line of sight. You don't know the cosmology, so you guess. The signature should be spherically symmetric, so if you guessed wrong, it won't be. And then once you have got, once you've made the right guess, that is the time when the signal will look spher like spherically isotropic. Okay. Um, so part of being able to constrain the cosmological model using this test means we must be able to get rid of this effect because this is obviously not spherically symmetric. And so redshift space distortions, Alcock-Pachinsky are sort of tied up together. Um, and uh, so we will set up some of that when we do the baryon acoustic oscillation signal. Yeah? Um, okay, so, so that was a super fast overview of a bunch of probes in large scale structure that use, uh, that use the growth, the gravitational growth. Now we'll, now we'll start the work, yeah? So, so we'll start, we'll start a, to do an estimate of what it is we're trying to measure. So let me see if I get this right. Um, escape, very good. Let me get this. Okay. Okay. So my goal is to try to make an estimate of what it is that is going to quantify the clustering of galaxies. Yeah? Um, and uh, so I want to first make an estimate of the sort of ballpark expected shape of the signal we're going to get. And then we'll get into how it might be distorted because we were looking at galaxies rather than at dark matter. Okay? Um, and, uh, and so the, so the thing I want to set up is uh, just an estimate of the shape of the power spectrum of galaxy, of, of dark matter. Okay. Um, so, so the power spectrum, so Eichiro mentioned the power spectrum when he was, when he was doing the CMB, right? You imagine that you have a density field, that density field you can decompose into plane waves, and the plane waves will have wavelength and amplitude. Different wavelengths can have different amplitudes. If you add different wavelengths can also have different directions. And so if I take all the waves of the same wavelength that are moving in different directions, those waves, there's a whole set of amplitudes. I can square those amplitudes. The mean square of that amplitude, that's the power spectrum. Okay? Um, and so it's sort of telling you if we live in a choppy, universe or a smooth universe. If it's choppy, then we have lots of, we have high amplitude for the short wave modes. If it's smooth, then we have long wave modes that matter and the short wave modes aren't there. Yeah? And so, so we'd like to know what is, what is the expected shape? What do we think our universe is? Yeah? And so, so the first step is to, is to try to work that out. Yeah? Is what, is, what is the set of uh, wavelengths, so the power spectrum. Okay, so we start up again. We write out uh, the the metric, right? Um, so 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 this one we've seen before. We've done the Robertson Walker metric as well, and uh, and so so we're going to we're going to try to use this. Okay? So we we'll go back and we say, where did this come from? So. So we write out uh, Einstein's equation, homogeneity, isotropy mean that, uh, that T mu nu is diagonal. 
And so we have density and pressure for T, for stress energy tensor. And conservation of stress energy tensor means that we have, uh, we have this guy equals zero. Okay? And so if you take this guy and you, and you, you, you compute this, so you take the derivatives with the Friedman-Robertson-Walker metric, when you take those derivatives, then what you'll find is that there's now a relation between, because this guy has to equal zero, a relation between the derivative of the density and the pressure. Okay? Um, and so this A cubed, so this is the density, and the A cubed is saying the universe expands, and A is labeling the expansion factor, um, and so, the, so you know, the volume is A cubed, right? So, um, so, 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 so this is sort of a relation between the density and the pressure. And if it's a relation between the density and the pressure, we can think of this as an equation of state. And if it's an equation of state, then a very simple model would be to say, well, maybe the pressure is proportional to the density. And the simplest model would be there's some proportionality constant that doesn't depend on time. You can, of course, imagine more complicated things that would, right? But just to, just to get a feel for, for, for what you get, um, we, can, we can insert, right? So we can say, if we start from here, and we insert this relation between pressure and density, then, uh, then you know, A cubed was the volume, and so we can just, you know, work out the derivatives. So here I've put the math. I won't work it out. You can go home and look through the slides. Um, and uh, the net result is you can solve for the density as a function of the expansion factor. Okay? Um, so, so notice, here I have density as a function of time. Here I have expansion factor. I haven't yet told you what the density is. As, I haven't yet told you A is a function of T. Um, but, so, so we, we can come back to that. But now we can ask, you know, what are some special cases? And so, one special case is where the pressure is zero, so a pressureless fluid. So if it's pressureless, um, then uh, that means W is zero. If you put W is zero, then the density is falling as A cubed. Okay? And so that's just, you have particles, and the number density of particles is conserved, the volume is expanding. So, so the density is decreasing. If there's radiation, then W is one-third. Radiation, the evolution, the energy density in radiation is one extra power of expansion factor because the number of photons is conserved, but their wavelengths are all dropping, uh, all being stretched, and so that's the extra, extra power there. Final case is when W equals minus one. When W equals minus one, then this density is a constant. And that's the dark energy, right? That's the simplest model of dark energy. Okay, um, so, so we'll, we'll remember these three scalings, okay? A cubed, A4, and constant, okay? And uh, so, you know, relativistic. So radiation means relativistic matter, non-relativistic, and vacuum energy, okay? Um, and we know from measurements today, we can count the photons in the microwave background, so we know the energy density today. We can extrapolate backwards in the past because it should scale as a to the four. We try to make estimates of the matter density today. We can scale that back as a to cubed. We know that today the matter density dominates the radiation density. Because they scale back at different times, we know there was an earlier time when they were equal. And at times earlier than that, the radiation dominated. From counting the photons today and from our crude estimate of the matter density today, uh, and remember the matter density is kind of a hard thing to estimate because a lot of the matter is dark. Yeah? But when we make that estimate, then we, we get an estimate of when this was. right? And this was a redshift of about 3,500, something like that. Um, so, so that was a redshift of about 3,000. And then this one is the cosmological constant, right? 
Um, and uh, so it dominates, you know, had it been a very large value, it would have dominated early. It's a low enough value that it only has just begun to dominate. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, we will always define the density in units of the critical density, and the critical density is 3 h squared over 8 pi g. I should have had that. At any given time, at redshift zero, we would put a zero. Um, okay. Matter radiation equality, just a crude estimate. Uh, because they scale with one power of expansion factor different from each other, if we take the ratio of the two, then that, that's that one expansion factor. So there's that one expansion factor, right? And so we take the ratio of omega matter is 0.3, and from counting up the photons, this number is 8.5 times 10 to the minus 5. This ratio is about 3,500. So that's the redshift of matter radiation inequality. The redshift at which the CMB photons was released was a redshift of 1,000. So this was a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, and uh, with this, we can associate a length scale. We can take the speed of light times that. Okay. Um, and if we do that, then we, we, you know, we can just work out what that number is. Um, and that will be the horizon size of the universe at that time. That horizon today has been stretched by this same factor, 3,500. And so that's an interesting length scale, right? What is that length scale? And so if you work through the numbers, that is of order 100 megaparsecs. Okay, so this is a number to have in the back of our heads. If we were looking for some feature in the data about something where matter starts to matter, then the matter radiation equality should have something on the scale of order 100 megaparsecs. Okay. Uh, Friedman equations. So, so we start from that, the same 0, 0 element that gave us you know, density in minus p. Um, and, uh, and we can write, a, we, we, we can take that one, which, you know, the, we said something, we said it should equal zero. Um, we can work out what that thing says, right? We can take time derivatives uh, from, uh, from, from the zero, zero elements, and we'll get now something that's going to let us start relating expansion factor with time. Okay, so we'll get time derivatives of expansion factor, uh, re related to the density. Okay. Um, so again, this is just going through algebra as we take derivatives. So there's the definition of the Hubble constant. This is 8 pi g rho, and this is the curvature term that we've now put on this side. Um, and, uh, and then this guy, because 3 h squared 8 pi g is the critical density, so we can group this guy with this. We define this as 1 minus omega, and that depends on the curvature with other stuff, and the curvature is plus or minus 1 or 0. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and this guy is the sum of everything in the universe. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's, let's consider a few cases. If the universe is empty, it's kind of a weird case to consider, then 1 minus omega is just 1. And so we have an expression that looks like this. So we can try to solve this guy, right? So all we've done here is rearrange, put AH squared is the curvature term with CR. And then what do we find? We find that if the curvature is 0, then AH should be 0. And if AH is 0, that means that because H is A dot over A, so A dot must be 0, which means A is constant. Yeah. Um, this thing is a square, and so that means this cannot be positive because this has to be a negative number. This one is also squared. Um, and then k can be negative 1. So we can have an, if the universe is empty, then the curvature must be negative 1. But then we have another constraint on, what, on how a must change with time. Yeah. So these are examples of how you can use the Friedman equation to tell you the evolution. Okay. Let's go to... A, Another example, this one is when omega matter equals 1. Now, 1 minus omega should equal 0. So if, 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 that, if that side equals 0, we can go back 
and we can ask, you know, what are allowed solutions? So in that, in that, we can ask what if A is a power law in time, then we can do the time derivative to get H is, is Q over T, and so we can solve for, um, you know, we, we already have rho is a power law in A, um, and so we can work out the relationship um, between this power law Q and W. And so now we have a relationship for A as a function of time that depends on W. But W, remember we took three cases. If it's matter dominated, if it's radiation dominated, or if it's dark energy dominated. And we can just plug in those different values to get how the expansion factor depends on time. So it's to the two thirds, to the one half, or exponential in time, right? So expanding exponentially when dark energy dominates. Okay. So, so, so this we care about at late times. This we care about at early times. At very early times, this. At slightly later times, this. Right? Radiation dominated to matter dominated to the present, which is dark energy dominated. Um, OK. Um, and so, you, so, so of course, for each of these, you can work out luminosity distance and stuff like that that we looked at before. OK. So let's make a plot. So here, as a function of time, is this is the scale factor. The scale factor is t to the one half when it's radiation dominated, is t to the two thirds when it's matter dominated, and then it's growing exponentially when it's dark energy dominated. Okay. Um, now, and the effect of you know, so so this is the the, the Friedman equation, the a dot over a squared. But now saying there's, you know, dark energy, matter, and uh, the, the sum of them should equal one, right? So these are the, this is the general expression that combines all three behaviors, okay? You can see um, that different terms will dominate at different times depending on the value of the expansion factor. This guy is A cubed, so at very early times, this guy is gonna matter more than the dark energy because A will be very small at early times, and so on. OK, so, so generically, we have this kind of behavior. So let me just tilt this guy over on its side, right? So we'll flip the axes. So now we're looking at time and expansion factor. And so, so it's the, it's the sa same curve as before, OK? Um, and so, so, so why do we do this? So, oops. So, so one reason for doing this is that now we can ask, um, so, so that's the same curve that we had before, okay? The black was the turns over when dark energy dominates, okay? Um, we can ask, what happens if we take, so, so this, is a, this represents a wavelength, a physical wavelength, okay? This was a short wavelength and this is a longer wavelength. The short wavelength gets stretched as time goes on, so it gets longer and longer and longer, okay? And this is a longer wavelength. And we can ask, these two wavelengths, what does it mean when they cross this boundary that we've drawn, okay? So, so one way to think about this is to say, well, this axis was like time, and the horizon, the causal horizon, but you know, particles could communicate over C times T. And so this is showing you the horizon size if you want. Yeah. And so a wavelength, so, so these two wavelengths here, they are outside the horizon. So they cannot have communicated with each other. Only once they have crossed inside the horizon can they communicate with one another. Okay? Can they exchange signals? And so in a picture like this, you have a problem. Eichiro mentioned the initial conditions. The initial conditions in this picture each wavelength should be independent of all the other wavelengths. They should know nothing about each other. 
And if that's true, then we have to explain how it is that the CMB has tiny fluctuations. How did the fluctuations know to arrange themselves to be the value that they are? And so inflation is trying to solve that by saying there was a time when the universe expanded a lot in a very short time. And so this boundary changed very rapidly. And if this boundary changed very rapidly, then that means that these modes were all inside the horizon at some early time. And so the initial conditions, they, they were all set then. You'll have a whole series of lectures about this and about a better way of describing this early time. I'm going to assume that something like this happened, but after that, the modes were outside the horizon, and then they had to re-enter the horizon at some later time. And this picture shows you that the short waves will enter first, and the longer waves will enter later. Now, the short waves will enter first, and so we can ask, no, with any wave that enters, does it enter during radiation domination or matter domination? And when they do, what happens? Yeah? So, so, so we, we'll, we'll, have to study, uh, we'll have to study these cases. And so if they're inside the horizon, then we can use a, we don't have to do the full relativistic treatment. We can just do a Newtonian kind of analysis. Okay? And if we do that, then we'd say, well, what, what happens? So Newtonian is acceleration is a force. The force is gravity. Um, and so this acceleration, we can now write in cosmology units. We write the mass as a background density times a volume, which is 4 pi over 3 r cubed. And then there was an r squared, so we just have an r. And we'll say the density was the background density times a perturbation, 1 plus delta. Okay. Um, now, if mass is conserved, then what that means is that as the object changes in size, then the density, um, so, 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 so we're just rearranging, right? So r cubed is 1 over the density times 1 over the delta, OK? And as the universe expands, then this guy is changing as a cubed. Okay, so there's the a cubed. Um, and, uh, and so we can ask what that means for r. So it says that r should go as a over 1 plus delta to the 1 third. Okay. And so then we can work out what dr by dt must be. So we just take derivatives. The derivative of a will give us like Hubble. Um, and we can start asking for you know, what happens with the delta. Okay, so we can expand to lowest order in delta. Okay. Um, so, so this was taking this guy, expand to lowest order in delta. And we want second derivative. Okay, so here we have the first derivative. Now we can take second derivative. And we can ask that this second derivative equals the result of getting the second derivative from here. Okay. And the, so, so we will get terms that have second derivatives of a, second derivatives of delta, and so on. Um, but the second derivatives of a, well, we had the Friedman equation, which was a dot over a squared, so h squared equaled uh, something with, with rho. Okay? And so we can, replace, uh, we can replace the terms like this in this expansion with, uh, with the Friedman equation. And uh, it's just a little bit of algebra that you can do at home to work out that you'll get a relation between the, the, the fluctuation as a function of time. Okay? And that will depend on the density omega h squared times delta. So this is a differential equation that you can now try to solve. OK, um, maybe I can come back to this next. Um, no, I should do it here. I'm a little short on time. So. Um, so, so let's do this one now. So if you have a mode that is longer than the horizon, okay. so again, we'll have the Friedman equation. h squared is 8 pi g rho uh, over 3. But let's now imagine that we had a universe that was just a little denser, okay? slightly higher density. So that means it's curved. If it's curved, then we'll, we'll write h squared with the curvature term. Okay? And we can think of the perturbation 
as the difference between this density and that one. Okay, so we can, we can just substitute these two expressions, okay, and we'll get something that has the curvature with an A squared. So delta goes like the curvature term, A squared, and then this guy. So this is showing you that when delta is small, okay, then this is going as A cubed. So we'll have an A cubed over A squared when you are matter dominated. So that's delta is proportional to A. And this is going as density is A to the four if it's radiation dominated. So this is A four over A squared, which means delta is A squared when you're radiation dominated. Okay? So you'll get these two different growths. So that means a cartoon of this is as a function of time. There's the length scale. The, a mode will grow. Then it will cross the horizon. And we can ask, does it grow inside the horizon? If it's matter dominated or if it's radiation dominated. And one of the things I'll work out when we come back next time is we'll work out the different growth rates when you're inside the horizon and matter dominated versus inside the horizon and radiation dominated. It will turn out that radiation domination has no growth or logarithmic growth, so it's very weak. And Achir also already mentioned this. No, you can think of the photons as moving around, preventing gravity from holding anything together. Yeah. Um, Whereas at late times, matter will dominate, and then there will be some growth. Um, so uh, let me see if I have a slide showing the, the solutions. Ah, here we go. So when it's radiation dominated, so that, this was the, the Friedman equation, then we can, we, we can try to solve for this. We substitute H is 1 over T. Okay. And the result is the logarithmic weak growth for the solution. In the future, if we have exponential expansion, so lambda dominates, so the growth factor is e to the ht. Um, so then when we solve this thing, h becomes a constant. Um, and then this growth is very suppressed. So the fluctuations stop growing in the future. Gravity can't fight the expansion. But during matter domination, uh, this, the, this has two solutions, one that grows with time and one that decays with time. So today, this is the relevant solution. And so the growth is proportional to t to the 2 thirds. But t to the 2 thirds is power in matter domination is one power of expansion factor. So delta is proportional to a. And so no growth in radiation domination Yes, growth in matter domination, proportional to A. Um, and so when we, when we come back on Wednesday, we'll put those together to get the shape of the power spectrum. But I should stop now, because I'm five. Yeah, so. <laughs>